The story begins by introducing a 75-year-old man named Jeremiah O'Keefe, a successful businessman and the father of 13 children. He owns eight funeral homes and one funeral insurance company in Biloxi. His family has been in this business for 100 years, but now it's facing financial trouble because Jeremiah suffered losses in a fraudulent investment scheme with one of his associates. Due to this fraud in the Ponzi scheme investment, Jeremiah had to deal with the state insurance commission, using the bank collateral of his funeral insurance company. Without this collateral, his business was in danger of closing down. His longtime friend and personal attorney, Mike Allred, suggested that Jeremiah sell a part of his business to cover the losses and keep the business going. Jeremiah agreed with Mike's advice, but didn't know where to find a buyer for his business. Mike then told him about a businessman named Ray Lowen, who owned the Lowen Group, a big company buying independent funeral businesses in various countries. Eventually, Jeremiah agreed to consider this option. As they were getting ready to go to Canada to meet Ray Lowen, Jeremiah introduced Mike to a young lawyer named Halbert Dockin, who was a friend of his son and a bright individual. At first, Jeremiah seemed a bit uneasy about Halbert's presence, possibly because of his skin color. However, he eventually welcomed him. When they arrived in Canada on Ray Lowen's luxurious cruise, they were greeted warmly with a seafood menu. During their conversation, Ray Lowen explained his strategy of acquiring many funeral homes. He knew that 51 million Americans were currently 65 years old, and America was entering a period where more people would pass away. Therefore, he expected to make a lot of money. Seeing Jeremy's surprised and uncomfortable reaction, Ray quickly changed the topic and focused on why they were there. Ray, suspecting that Jeremiah was having issues with state regulators, offered to buy three of Jeremiah's funeral homes. This way, Jeremiah could keep some assets and have fresh funds to deal with his problems. Finally, Jeremiah agreed, but had one condition that Ray Lewin would no longer operate a funeral insurance business in southern Mississippi. Jeremiah also had an insurance company there, which was his biggest source of income. Four months went by, and Jeremiah, growing increasingly desperate and confused, noticed that the Lowen Group continued to alter the terms and delay payments. Halbert believed that the Lowen Group was deliberately doing this and had no intention of honoring the agreement. He thought that the longer the delay, the more pressure Jeremia would face, possibly leading to the revocation of his business license by the insurance commission. In the end, Jeremia had to declare bankruptcy, which automatically allowed the Lowen Group not only to acquire three funeral homes, but also Jeremiah's entire business at a very low cost. Mike, who had been somewhat skeptical of Halbert from the beginning, mainly because he was a recent black graduate, initially dismissed Halbert's conspiracy theory and argued against the unfounded accusations. But feeling constantly underestimated, Halbert stood his ground. He pointed out that the agreement had only been signed by Jeremiah, without any verification attached, and furthermore, Lowen was still selling funeral insurance in Mississippi. Hearing this convincing argument, Jeremiah finally decided to sue Lowen. That night, Jeremiah sought permission from his wife, Annette, to file a lawsuit against the Lowen Group in the Hines County, Mississippi, High Court. Although he didn't receive full support from Annette, the next day, Jeremiah proceeded to file a lawsuit against the Lowen Group. In the evening, Halbert visited Jeremiah's house and played a recording of a skilled lawyer named Willie Gary. Willie was a famous and incredibly successful lawyer, specializing in personal injury and accident cases. He had not lost a single case in the past 12 years, including a case where a black man won a $75 million lawsuit after being hit by a company's container while intoxicated. Halbert suggested that Jeremiah should hire Willie as their lawyer for a specific reason. He explained that since their case was filed in Hines County, where there were three black residents for every white resident, and there was a 70% chance that the judge would also be black, it wouldn't be appropriate for Jeremiah to appoint Mike as his representative. According to Halbert, Mike gave off an air of an arrogant white man, and this was a concern because in 1965, when the case occurred, racism between black and white people was still deeply ingrained in America. However, after reviewing their case, Willie declined to take it on. 
He explained to Reggie Douglas, his colleague, that Jeremy's case was challenging to win and had many uncertainties. Willie also mentioned that he had never handled contract cases, and a claim of $6 million was relatively small for him. Additionally, he had never represented a white male client before. After leaving the office, a determined Halbert returned to Willie's office and managed to convince him that this case had the potential to result in more than $6 million in damages. He pointed out that the Lowen Group was a massive multinational company with an annual revenue of $20 billion, and what they did to Jeremiah might be just a small part of their wrongdoing. Halbert's persuasive arguments eventually changed Willie's mind, and he agreed to take on Jeremiah's case. The next day, at Mike's office, Jeremiah informed them that he had hired Willie to handle his case. Although initially reluctant, Mike eventually agreed to cooperate as long as he remained the lead attorney. Shortly after, Willie and several partners from his all-black law firm joined Mike's office. There was a disagreement between Mike and Willie. Mike, as the lead attorney, wanted to settle with the opposing group and accept an $8 million settlement. However, Willie, full of confidence, saw it as a weak decision and refused to settle for such a small amount. Seeing Willie's optimism, Jeremiah eventually persuaded Mike to let Willie take the lead. After Mike accepted Jeremiah's decision, Willie drafted a new demand letter. He rejected Mike's $8 million offer and increased their demand to $100 million. Hearing this incredible demand of $100 million, many people on Mike's side, including Jeremiah, became pessimistic about the Lowen Group agreeing to it. However, Willie emphasized that they should all believe in him because he was confident they would win the case. Meanwhile, at the Lowen Group, Ray's associates laughed at the $100 million demand. However, Ray himself was curious about the new lawyer Jeremiah had appointed as his representative. After learning about Willie's background and the reason behind his appointment, which was because he was black, Ray decided to hire a black female lawyer named Maine Downs. She was a Harvard graduate with numerous achievements and was known by the nickname Pitten due to her unique style of questioning and her tendency for surprising opponents. Back at home, Jeremiah informed Annette that they no longer had income because their funeral business license had been temporarily revoked by regulators. He had also mortgaged their house to pay Willie. He desperately hoped that winning the lawsuit would fix everything. Annette suggested that Jeremiah drop the lawsuit and find another buyer quickly to get their family out of the crisis. However, Jeremiah refused because he couldn't let Ray get away with what he had done. Since Hines County didn't have adequate courtroom facilities, the trial was moved to Jackson, Mississippi. On the plane, Jeremiah asked Willie about how he became a lawyer. Willie shared a personal story about his determination to become a lawyer after facing discrimination when a company refused to sell apartments to him and his family just because they were black. This experience fueled his passion for fighting against discrimination and injustice. Jeremiah felt a connection with Willie, as both of them were battling to preserve their family legacies and pass their businesses down to their descendants. To celebrate their newfound friendship, Willie played his favorite song, and they all sang along during the flight. Upon arriving in Jackson and checking into their hotel, they discovered that the Lowen Group's legal team was also staying there. In addition to Mame, there were other highly experienced lawyers, including a former state deputy, an expert in anti-monopoly law, and a former chief justice of Mississippi. This team comprised some of the most prominent black lawyers in America at the time. Willie paid particular attention to Mame and introduced himself by sending over drinks. During a meeting with Mike and their legal team, they grew pessimistic about their chances because the contract they had was signed only by Jeremia. Proving the Lowen Group's deliberate delay tactics without concrete evidence or witnesses was proving to be a challenge. Meanwhile, Willie, looking for a break, met Maine at the hotel bar. At first, Maine was distant and reserved, but Willie managed to engage her in conversation by subtly suggesting that she might be on the wrong side of the case. As they got to know each other, Maine provocatively questioned whether Willie would be destroyed once the trial began. On September 12, 1995, during the initial trial, Willie made efforts to persuade the jury and judges that there had indeed been a valid agreement between both parties. 
He presented meetings and contracts provided by the Lowen Group, which bore Jeremy's signature as evidence of this agreement. Willie exposed the Lowen Group's greed and their deliberate efforts to delay approval, which ultimately led to his client's financial troubles. However, all of Willie's arguments were countered by Mame. She argued that the agreement became legally binding when both parties signed the contract. According to Mame, Jeremiah had simply grown impatient and anxious because his entire life depended on the agreement. Despite Willie's efforts, the expert witnesses he presented failed to capture the jury and judge's attention. They discussed theoretical contract law without substantial evidence to support Willie's case. Feeling defeated after the first trial, Willie, who was unsure about his next steps, decided to put Jeremiah on the stand in the upcoming trial. The whole legal team strongly disagreed with this decision. Willie was convinced that Jeremiah's background as a veteran and his contributions to the black community would gain sympathy from the jury and judges. However, Mike opposed this, stating that Jeremiah should have been thoroughly prepared before taking the stand. Halbert shared Mike's concerns, worried about the rigorous cross-examination that the low inside would conduct on Jeremia. In the courtroom the next day, Willie did his best and effectively drew the jury's attention by highlighting Jeremia's impressive profile as an Air Force veteran and a two-term mayor of Biloxi. Jeremia had bravely opposed the extremist group known as the Ku Klux Klan, KKK which had a history of white supremacy and violence against black people and other minorities in the United States. Now it was Mame's turn to question Jeremia and present her inquiries. She shattered Jeremia's image as a respected figure with strong moral values by accusing him of irresponsible actions. She claimed that Jeremiah had used clients' money for an illegal loan business with a friend who was now in prison. This business failure had led Jeremiah into debt, ultimately forcing him to sell the funeral homes to Ray. It appeared as though Jeremiah was trying to extort money from Lowen due to his failure to preserve his family's funeral home legacy. Ming's surprising statements left Jeremiah stunned, breaking his spirit and prompting him to leave the courtroom. Willie followed Jeremiah and apologized for his hasty decision to make him a witness in the trial. Jeremiah expressed that he had expected Willie to protect him during the trial. As a result of this incident, Jeremiah returned the leadership role to Mike. Feeling guilty for his decision, Willie reached out to Jeremiah's wife to share his frustrations about how he had disrupted Jeremiah's case. After examining various documents, Halbert discovered a witness named Lorraine, who had worked for 13 years at the Darbin Anson Funeral Home, later acquired by the Lowen Group. Loring testified that since the Lowen Group took over Darbin Anson, they had raised prices on certain items in the area with no competition. They were even selling coffins at three times the price in impoverished areas. Lorraine's testimony gave a slight advantage to Jeremiah's side, as it indicated that Lowen may have engaged in fraudulent practices in their business. In the evening, feeling pressured by Mike during the trial, the Lowen Group planned to retaliate by tarnishing the characters of Jeremiah's team, just as they had done to Jeremia. Meanwhile, Willie, still feeling guilty for his actions a few days ago, apologized and Jeremiah accepted his apology. During a meeting in Jeremiah's team room, one of the staff members came across an agreement between the Lowen Group and the NBC Church, the largest black church subdivision in America. Intrigued by this discovery, Halbert instructed his staff to gather more information about it, which might become a valuable tool in the trial. In the subsequent trial, Douglas called Mike to testify, since he was with Jeremiah in Canada when the agreement was made. After answering a few questions from Douglas, it was Mame's turn to cross-examine him. Mame believed that throughout the trial, Mike had been trying to gain the sympathy of the jury and judges by sharing Jeremiah's heroic stories and his stand against the KKK in Biloxi, portraying him as a hero in the eyes of the black community. Then, Mame trapped Mike with a family statement. Mike had claimed that he and Jeremiah both cherished their families and believed family was everything. However, Mame skillfully questioned Mike about his grandfather's affiliation with the KKK. This revelation caused a stir in the courtroom, mostly filled with black people. It seemed to suggest that the image of caring and heroism 
spilt throughout the trial was hypocritical, as it was now revealed that one of Jeremiah's lawyers had a family history linked to a racist group that had deprived black people of their rights. Following a trial that once again disadvantaged Jeremiah's side, an internal conflict arose. This led to Willie's subordinates resigning after learning about Mike's family history and his connection to the KKK, who had harmed their own community. Willie tried to reassure his subordinates that the sins of one's grandfather shouldn't be blamed on their grandchildren. However, they still chose to withdraw from the trial. Unable to bear the stigma of being associated with the KKK, Mike decided to resign and handed over the task of defending Jeremiah to Willie. Facing a trial that wasn't going in their favor and losing his team, Jeremiah contemplated whether to continue the trial or not. He planned to inform Willie directly of his decision. Meanwhile, in Jeremiah's team meeting room, Halbert and some staff members began packing up documents. Believing it was impossible to win the trial, Mike asked them to leave the documents and started reviewing them himself. Meanwhile, Jeremiah traveled to Florida to meet with Willie. When he arrived at Willie's parents' house, he was warmly greeted by Gloria, Willie's mother. Willie wasn't there at the moment, but Gloria happily escorted Jeremiah to his location within the house. While they chatted, Gloria shared that Willie was one of eleven siblings and had always been close to her, paying great attention to her even as he grew up. She believed that his strong bond with her had contributed to his success. In the backyard, Jeremiah finally expressed his intention to withdraw the lawsuit to Willie. With no remaining evidence or witnesses for the trial, Willie reluctantly accepted this decision. However, a call from Halbert interrupted them, urging Willie to prevent Jerumia from withdrawing the lawsuit because Halbert seemed to have discovered something important. Excited by this unexpected news from Halbert, they immediately headed to South Mississippi to meet with the majority of black residents affiliated with the NBC church. During the meeting, community representatives revealed that a year ago, the Lowen group had proposed a deal to the NBC, which represented over 33,000 black churches with 8 million members. The Lowen group had been chosen as the primary provider of funeral services for the NBC. They offered various products, including headstone funerals, underground burials, and funeral insurance. The Lowen group had recruited economically disadvantaged black individuals to sell their products to others in the community, earning commissions in return. However, the Lowen group had set exorbitant prices for their services. Those with financial means received proper burials with headstones, while those without were buried in unmarked graves on top of their ancestors' resting places, making it seem like an expansive field. It became clear that the Lowen group had taken advantage of the black community for significant financial gain. They were known to misuse cemetery land by constructing monuments, large statues, and even buildings on land that had been paid for by black individuals. Willie brought several residents as witnesses to court to expose Lowen's deceit in recruiting pastors to sell religion as a means to boost their product sales. Some witnesses revealed that due to a lack of funds to pay for funeral packages, their family members' bodies were kept frozen until they could afford it, and some were provided with plywood caskets. Lowen's practices were exploitative when it came to their funeral services. One Lowen group analyst who had been instrumental in the deal with the NBC admitted that by contributing just $200,000, the Lowen group had made a staggering profit of $1.2 billion from their collaboration with the NBC. Following the trial, the Lowen group was understandably alarmed by the damning evidence presented by Willie. To prevent the situation from escalating further, Maine decided to have Ray Lowen himself appear in court to address the accusations against the Lowen group. However, instead of improving the Lowen group's image, Ray's presence was dismantled by Willie during cross-examination, depicting him as a wealthy man who cunningly exploited the sorrows of the poor for massive profits. It was revealed that Lowen had intentionally harmed honest small business owners like Jeremiah to expand his business network. Willie successfully demonstrated the Lowen group's motives before the jury, the judge, and everyone in the courtroom. This humiliation in court infuriated Lowen, and he exploded with anger during a meeting at the Lowen group's lawyer's office. He asked Mame to negotiate with Jeremiah and stop the trial before it got even worse. On the other hand, 
a meeting took place between Jeremiah and Lowen in a hotel room to discuss compensation in exchange for dropping the case. Lowen presented three offers, but Jeremiah rejected each one. The trial the following day didn't see much presented by either Jeremiah or the Lowen group. The proceedings moved to the stage where the judge would make decisions based on the jury's considerations during the trial. On November 1, 1995, the jury ruled in favor of Jeremiah as the plaintiff, agreeing to the demand of $100 million against the Lowen group. They also imposed a punitive damages verdict of $400 million that the Lowen group had to pay to Jeremia. It was an unexpected victory for Jeremia, who had initially been pessimistic about losing the trial. This was a significant setback for Lowen in his career. The judge and jury were furious with the giant company's greed, which had exploited the victims of Lowen's partnership package clients, draining their wealth. They were determined not to let the company escape with the enormous profits they had gained from taking advantage of the disadvantaged. Willie and Mame became friends during and after Jeremiah and Lowen's trial. Following an appeal, the Lowen group's sentence was eventually reduced, and they had to pay a settlement offer of $175 million. Two years later, Ray Lowen was forced to resign as president of his own company. Less than a year after that, the Lowen group went bankrupt. Jeremiah and Annette established a charitable foundation to help the less fortunate, with over 40% of the aid going through the O'Keefe Foundation they founded specifically to support black people, schools, and churches. Their funeral home continued to operate as the largest family-owned funeral business in South Mississippi. Willie became a renowned lawyer, winning major cases against some of the largest companies in America and earning the nickname Giant Killer. Willie and Jeremiah remained close friends until Jeremiah's passing in August 2016. Moral lesson from the story, just like Jeremiah turned a giant lawsuit into a victory, always believe in yourself, because who knows, even a squirrel can outsmart an elephant in the courtroom.